Hi, my name is Dr. John Pilcher. I'm a bariatric surgeon in San Antonio, and I've been doing bariatric surgery for a little more than 20 years. Of course, as a bariatric surgeon, I've had many, many conversations with patients about the right way of eating around bariatric surgery or just for routine weight maintenance. The good news also is that science has been improving in the last several years to support some of the ideas that we've long held and to give us some new information um, debunking some of the old ideas that we used to have. And so today I'd like to share kind of a distillation of my best understanding supported by science for a practical guide to healthy eating. And this mainly will apply to people who have had bariatric surgery or who are contemplating bariatric surgery, but hopefully it'll be of practical use to anybody who suffers from a disrupted or an out of balance metabolism and some level of obesity. Now my experience is that many people who suffer from obesity are already doing a good job with a practical healthy diet. Of course, they are very interested in the current science and what that has to offer. The tricky thing is that there's a lot of mixed information out there, and so it's hard for the layperson to know what to follow. And what's going on here is that food also is big business. Um, there's lots of marketing that is masquerading as information, and so there's lots of confusion out there. Also, the science has been developing quite briskly over the last few years, and I hope it will continue to develop so that perhaps we give an updated message a few years from now. So this is today's best understanding. Now, in order to understand everything else that I'm going to talk about, you have to believe, as I do, that obesity is a metabolic condition. It's an imbalance in the body's control system, an imbalance in the fat storage system, so that the body thinks that it needs to hold on to excess weight. Uh, I've talked extensively about this in one of my other videos, so I'm just going to leave that as a foundational principle for the rest of this talk. And now, as we look at the impact of food on metabolism, we need to understand that food isn't just calories, but food is a hormonally active substance that affects what happens with the metabolism. And that's not just true with the food itself, but it's also very true of all the stuff that we put into the food, especially in our modern industrial society. And as I'll touch on multiple times through this video, um, the additives are going to be a big part of what makes food healthy or unhealthy. Since these are supposed to be ideas for practical healthy eating, they should be sustainable. And that means that the food ideas that I give you should not be painful, they should not be especially difficult, they should come naturally. And it starts with healthy eating and the hormone impact of food. So if one eats healthy food, then it should lead to a better metabolic balance, and one should have a natural desire for more of the typical healthy foods so that it becomes a sustainable thing over time. We're not talking about a diet in the sense that people usually mean it with a food restriction. We're talking about a change in lifestyle. Another key principle that I'll depend on extensively throughout the video is the idea that a healthy metabolism leads to a healthy hunger that a person can rely on and use as a signal for proper food choices. Whereas many people with a broken or an imbalanced metabolism have an unhealthy hunger, we call that cravings, and you can't trust your hunger. So um, as I talk about, Using hunger as a signal, um, it does depend on the assumption that you're in a healthy metabolic state. Now you can get to a healthy metabolic state through proper eating, hopefully over an extended period of time, and then the uh, quickest and the most potent way to get to a healthy metabolic state is through bariatric surgery such as a sleeve or a gastric bypass. For a person with a healthy balanced metabolism, the right food choices lead to satisfaction in the absence of hunger, whereas the wrong food choices lead to increased hunger and the wrong food choices with the metabolic imbalance, the metabolic stress, and the increased hunger can lead to an out-of-balance metabolism over time. Since we're talking about food as a hormonally active substance that can affect your hunger level and can affect your metabolism, the right food plan is mostly about what you eat and the quality of your food. It's a little bit about the timing of, you, of your eating, and it's not much about the amount of food that you eat. In other words, quality is more important than quantity, and if you take care of hunger, then the quantity piece will take care of itself as a natural outcome. This lets us move away from a numerical food plan so that we're not very concerned with counting calories or protein grams or carbs or fats. We are concerned about the quality of the food and that's what's the food made from, what are the balances of these macronutrients, and as I'll mention in a little bit, we're also concerned that that food has high quality in terms of having low chemicals and low additives. Now, I know from conversations that this move away from a numerical food plan is difficult for a lot of people. The question comes up, well, how much do I eat? How do I know when to eat? 
And I go back to the principle that if your metabolism is in a healthy balance, whether that's surgical or whether you just take good care of your metabolism, then your body will let you know how much to eat and when to eat and when to stop eating as well. And this is a different experience from that of people who have a currently out of balance or broken metabolism. I think of diabetes, I think of um, artificial sweetener dependence, and uh, these folks have a continuous cycle of feeling a crash and then an energy high. They have an unhealthy metabolism, they have unhealthy hunger, and that's what we're going to try to work our way out of. Throughout this video, I'm talking about having an improved metabolic balance. The right eating is a big part of that improved metabolic balance, but it's not the only piece. We may also need to talk to patients about different exercise, including strengthening. We may need to talk to them about vitamins. We may need to talk to them about pharmacologic treatment, that's appetite suppressants. And of course, as a bariatric surgeon, I always have surgery in my background. I'm not gonna discuss those other parts in this video, but they can be part of getting a person into a more healthy metabolic balance that lasts over time. Before I shift into the specifics of a healthy practical eating plan, I need to help deepen understanding about the metabolic disease just a bit. And the key point here is that there is not one metabolic disease. There are a variety or a spectrum of metabolic obesity diseases. People have different genetics. People have different medical history. People even have a different environment or even a different gut microbiome, which does affect the metabolism. So people are going to have different responses to different foods. And when I get to guidelines in a minute, um, there are going to be some core principles that I think everyone agrees on, but there are also going to be substantial variations from person to person. And so one key thing that I want people to understand is that each individual needs to monitor their own response to the food plan and find a food plan that feels right for them. For a diet plan to feel right, it means that when one eats, then one has satisfaction and one does not have stimulation of hunger. We can be scientific or numerical about this and do continuous blood glucose monitoring. And we find that if a person eats a meal and the blood glucose spikes up and then crashes down, that food is bad for that patient at that time. And this is because the sharp rise in blood sugar and the sharp fall in blood sugar is stressful for the body, but it's also a sign that that particular food is not well tolerated. There are probably numerous other hormones that we could use for um, tracking this as well. And happily, science is improving so that maybe the average individual five years from now can have continuous, comfortable, comfortable blood glucose monitoring so that they'll know what food is doing in their body. In the meantime, one's hunger response is the best way of knowing. So try to be attentive to your body and observe what's happening inside your body. And the point of this little segment is to let you know that there are going to be many different details about what the right food plan is for each individual. Also, each individual's ideal food plan may change over time. It may change with age. It may change with medical condition. It may change because of a surgical procedure. It may change because of an adverse medical event. Or again, it may change because the gut microbiome is altered. This wide variation among individuals in the obesity disease explains why some diets have become popular over time. There are many diets that are based on sound nutritional principles, and many of these diets work really, really well for a part of the population. And as those people track their results and distribute their results, there's a lot of understandable enthusiasm. But because people vary dramatically, as we discussed, genetically, uh, medically, um, there has not yet been found one diet plan that works universally well for all individuals. Moving forward into some specific guidelines about how to eat in a healthy way, I'm going to try to make a clear distinction between the ideas that are almost universally accepted and move from those down into ideas that may vary substantially from individual to individual. And again, I want to emphasize that as an individual trying these diets, you need a way to know if this is working for you and the best guide that we have right now is your own physical sensation of hunger. How much does it take to get you full? How long does that satisfaction last? I've been talking about some background for my guidelines, and in a minute I'll talk about extensive specific ideas that fall out of these guidelines, but the whole picture, the whole diet plan can be boiled down to one sentence. We want people to have minimal chemicals and minimal carbs in their diet. Now, the minim minimal chemical piece is nearly universally agreed in the bariatric and the obesity treatment community. Uh, we understand that preservatives and artificial sweeteners are somehow causing a disruption or imbalance of the metabolism, and so these need to be reduced to have the metabolism come back into a healthier balance. 
I believe for most people who have had a disrupted metabolism at some point, that's obesity, that low carb is also important, although that's a little bit more controversial in our field. And that's an area that I think that people really need to see how their body is working. Let's unpack this idea of low chemical a little bit. I think that first of all, we understand that preservatives can be counterproductive and many other additives that go into foods can be counterproductive. And when you look at your food label, you want to be able to recognize the names of all the ingredients that go into your food and they shouldn't have, you know, 12 syllables long and come out of chemistry class. Um, now, chemicals also include artificial sweeteners and uh, this is bad news for some Americans that are attached to their sweet flavor, but uh, chemical does refer to the old fashioned artificial sweeteners and the more modern artificial sweeteners. And um, even the ones that are currently marketed as being very healthy, um, we're concerned about and they do st tend to stimulate appetite and they do tend to disrupt metabolism. Uh, and, and I want to circle back here and remind people that the uh, food industry does have marketing, and so the information about healthy artificial sweeteners uh, needs to be taken with a grain of salt. And so when we combine this with the idea that we want to take out carbs as well, um, and most people in our field agree that sugars and concentrated sweets are counterproductive, then what we're asking our patients to do is to pretty much take the sweet flavor out of your whole food plan. And this may sound hard because people, like I mentioned, become attached to their sweet flavor, but um, it goes back to the idea that if you eat healthy for a sustained period, you can help your body come into a healthier metabolic balance, and the healthy foods will be the foods that tend to become natural that you have a desire for. And what we are permitting are all the spicy flavors and all the savory flavors. And as I'll circle back to in a little bit, even some uh, fatty flavors are okay. But the sweet flavor, uh, pretty much in whatever form you get it, is going to be a little bit counterproductive. The leading foods that we do include in our practical healthy food plan are proteins and green vegetables, as well as all the spices that you want for interest. Proteins, they can be animal proteins, they can be seafood proteins, um, poultry, um, dairy, they can be vegetable proteins, legumes, any of those seem to be acceptable sources of protein. I'll say more about the amount of protein in a little while, but for now suffice it to say that I don't think it's important to push protein. Uh, green vegetables are salads, broccoli, um, cooked or fresh, um, fresh is actually better in many cases, all of those that you want. The other category of foods that we're not opposed to are fats, and um, this is a bit different than was taught 10 or 15 years ago. Um, we understand that fats actually promote satiety. Fats do not promote hunger like carbohydrates do. And so fats can certainly be a healthy part of an overall practical eating plan. Here again, I don't emphasize massive amounts of fats or overwhelming amounts of fats, but we accept them as part of a healthy plan. The main category of natural foods that I haven't mentioned yet is carbohydrates, and there is developing information on this topic. My understanding at this time is that most carbohydrates are counterproductive for people who have once had an unhealthy metabolism, even if they're in a healthy metabolic balance at this time, it seems to me that carbohydrates are likely to push back towards an unhealthy balance. And I think that everyone agrees that concentrated sweets like candies and sugar are counterproductive. Um, I also believe that potatoes and rice and pasta and breads are counterproductive. And I also believe that fruits are counterproductive because they have sugar. It's natural sugar, but it's still nature's candy, and I mean candy in a bad way in this context. Now, I will share with you honestly that there are uh, some researchers who believe that even for bariatric patients and folks with obesity history, that uh, fruits and selected carbs can be useful. So this may be developing further over time. Again, I want to return to the principle that you need to observe your body and observe how your body reacts to the food that you take in with the goal of having your food lead to the least practical hunger that you can experience. As I've already mentioned, it's generally agreed that artificial foods don't fit into a healthy practical eating plan. How do you know what's an artificial food? Well, there are a couple of different ways to know. If a food can sit on the shelf for six months and look and taste just like it did when you bought it, that's an artificial food. I like to look at the list of ingredients. And um, when I was thinking about this video, I was thinking I would recommend that uh, a healthy food, a natural food should have no more than three ingredients on the label. That turns out not to be right. I think less than 10 is a useful guideline. And then let's just make sure that when you look at the list of ingredients that you can understand each item that's in the ingredient list. Um, I happen to have in my pantry uh, some light bread, some uh, low fat bread and it has 34 ingredients, including many chemical names. 
This brings me to a, another topic that fits with how to watch out for artificial foods. Um, many foods now are marketed as being light or low calorie or low fat or low carb. And I think in general, these foods should be avoided because what's happening is the manufacturer is taking out the fat or the sugar. Yes, they're taking out some carbs, but they're substituting some kind of chemicals to make it still be palatable or taste worthy. And mostly these chemicals that are put in are going to have worse negative effects than the fat or the sugar that was taken out. The topics is about protein shakes. And many people, naturally enough, will jump to the idea of protein shakes when we talk about a medical eating plan. And it's tricky because we do use protein shakes in bariatric surgery as a preparation step for surgery. Uh, many programs recommend protein shakes as a part of the recovery plan. Um, I don't recommend them for my patients. Uh, but I think that all bariatric team members agree that uh, in the long run, as you're trying to shift into the rest of your life beyond recovery, that natural food is preferred over protein shakes and protein bars. The problem with the protein shakes and protein bars is that they're artificial, uh, and as artificial substances, they include preservatives and they include artificial sweeteners, and the flavor isn't as satisfying as actual food would be for most people. And um, the other thing is that um, they don't stick to your ribs very well because these are liquid or easily digested proteins um, versus natural proteins such as chicken um, or fish or something of that nature. Uh, so again, I don't think that people need to force protein. I don't want you having protein because you think you need it. I don't want you thinking that protein shakes have some special medical benefit. Um, I think that protein shakes should be used only in exceptional circumstances. One of those uh, is that if it works for you to grab a protein shake on the way out of the house in the morning and that protein shake in the car as you're rushing to work uh, stops you from getting a muffin at Starbucks, okay, I can accept that but I don't think that protein shake is adding anything for you that couldn't have been supplied by eggs or ham in the morning, or if you want convenience, then you could have had a piece of deli meat or a piece of cheese or a handful of nuts on the way out of the house. Those are all actual foods uh, that in my mind are preferred over the protein shakes when you're hungry. And the other thing about protein shakes is they bring with them the idea that you should eat or you have planned eating. And um, I, I do want you to develop habits about how you eat, but I don't want you eating because you think you're supposed to eat. I want you eating because you feel that you're supposed to eat. That represents a balanced, healthy metabolism, and it helps maintain a balanced, healthy metabolism. So protein shakes, in summary, should have a very limited role in the long run after bariatric surgery. We all recognize that human nature comes into this plan, and temptations through the course of the day come into this plan. And so what I like to teach patients is that the first part of the day is the most important part of the day to be on track with a healthy eating plan. That means avoiding the bad stuff and choosing the good stuff. Now, I don't tell patients that they have to eat breakfast. I'll talk about intentional fasting a little bit later on. But whatever your first meal of the day is, is going to have a substantial impact on the course of your metabolism through the course of the day. So if you eat sugars or artificial chemicals in the very first part of the day, it's going to stress your system and make your blood sugar spike up and then crash, which is a different system stress. And when your sugar crashes, you're going to have cravings. You're going to have hunger that's difficult to control. And this sugar coaster is not a good ride to be on. So especially in the first part of the day, you want to stick with your proteins, your green vegetables, keep your carbs to a minimum. I would say no fruits in the first part of the day and really watch out for the artificial chemicals into your food. And one key thing, and, and guys, I'm sorry, I'm going to use a brand name. Stay away from Coffee Mate. Stay away from International Coffees. These things are pitched as non-dairy. But remember, when you take out one of these fat, you know, natural things, you put in chemicals. And if you look at the label of ingredients for Coffee Mate or International Coffees, it's cornstarch, it's high fructose corn syrup, and it's poison. And this is one of the biggest pitfalls that people have in the morning is they're putting this toxin into their coffee. And no matter what else they do at the beginning of the day, it can mess up their pattern for the whole rest of the day. So watch out for that. Now, having said that the first part of the day is the most important, I don't want people to totally let go in the later part of the day. I still think that the later part of the day matters. And what I teach my patients who are working on better habits is every day is a new day. And every day you have a chance at a healthy, normal, balanced metabolism. And the further into the day that you take care of that metabolic balance with healthy eating and avoiding the bad stuff, then the longer and longer in the day, it's going to be easier to do the right thing. And then carry that through a week. If you get on track Monday through Friday, excellent. If you can carry it into Saturday, excellent. If you can do it for three weeks in a row, that's even better. 
So this is something that you can build on every day, but if you mess up on some day, then the next morning you have a chance to start over again on the right foot. When I listed the foods that are included in a routine healthy eating plan, the first thing that I listed was protein. Everybody agrees that protein is a useful source of a healthy practical eating plan, but there are wide variations in the amount of protein that people prescribe. In my own practice, I like to stay away from a numerical approach and focus on what's the physical sensation. The other thing that uh, I like to try to re-educate patients about, um, especially patients that have been studying and working on this for quite a long time, is I'd like you to be protein focused but not protein obsessed. In other words, I don't want you to ever eat protein because you think you need to. I want you to eat protein because you feel that you need it. And again, I'm counting on you having a healthy metabolic balance at this point. I'm counting on you having an accurate sensation of hunger. And fortunately, that is true for the vast, vast majority of patients, and so it's reliable. One practical thing that comes out of this is that it's okay for people to eat legumes or salads instead of protein or to eat the salad first and not worry about blocking out the protein. My experience is that patients will feel a desire for protein when they need protein. And the same thing goes with salts and the same thing goes with spices. Uh, so generally I advise people to follow their taste as long as their appetite and their hunger are in a healthy balance. Um, if you want some chicken, eat some chicken. If you want some salad, eat some salad. If you feel like garlic, then put some garlic on there. Now, if you feel like pecan pie, no, you should question whether your appetite is in a healthy balance because most of the time you're going to desire the healthy foods when your metabolism is working appropriately. Well, I was in the editing process and I realized that I had completely forgotten to talk about the timing of eating. And the timing matters because it turns out that it can be important for the body's uh, energy system to go through natural cycles of storing energy, that's eating, versus drawing on energy between meals. And it turns out to actually be pretty important to not constantly feed the body during the course of the day. In other words, it's not a good idea to eat six or eight small meals and to constantly be nibbling and snacking. Uh, part of what we hope to do is create a situation where a person only feels hungry one or two or three times per day. That's part of the healthy, balanced metabolism. And uh, as with so many other things in this video, we want people to follow their natural sensations as long as the natural sensations are healthy. And so I mentioned it is reasonable to eat breakfast or not, depending on how a person feels. If you feel hungry, eat breakfast. If you don't feel hungry at breakfast time, then we really believe that's okay. And we can take this even a step further into a plan or a style that is called intentional fasting that seems to be beneficial for many patients where people may eat once per day if they feel comfortable with that or they may eat twice per day or they may eat on some semi-irregular plan. And um, it turns out that having extended time periods of not feeling hungry and feeling comfortable eating twice per day or once per day uh, probably indicates a healthy uh, metabolic balance. And so this style of eating called intentional fasting um, can actually be a goal, although it's not required for all patients. I'm often asked if desserts have a part in a healthy practical eating plan, and the answer is yes and no. Uh, I don't think that desserts are ever healthy for you. I don't think they ever really contribute to your health, but if they contribute to your sense of well-being, uh, mental, social, I think they're acceptable. I think the key thing is, number one, just be intellectually honest. Don't lie to yourself. And if you're having a dessert, call it a dessert and make it up in some other way, whether that be exercise or better dieting on the next day. Also, be wary of foods that are packaged as healthy desserts. Um, diet fudge or diet ice cream. Still, because there are chemicals in them, they're going to have effects in your body just like the real thing. So if it feels like a dessert, if it acts like a dessert, call it a dessert and just have a very small amount and go forward. I hope the message I'm giving with these guidelines is the idea that food is fine, food is natural, food is healthy, food can be enjoyable, eating is not a sin. One just wants to be conscious about making the right food choices to get the best health and hormonal benefit from the food. This idea of being conscious needs to last over years and years because there are many social, cultural forces uh, that will push you out of balance with your eating plan. There are marketing forces that will push you out of balance with your eating plan. If you listen to radio, listen to watch TV, you'll find that the amount of uh, food advertising is crazy out there. But once again, food does have important and valid cultural and social significance. So food's not to be eliminated, food's not to be shunned, food's not a closet activity. Food is an appropriate social activity 
as well as something that's natural for one's energy and survival. The next natural thing to discuss is the result that a person might expect from following a practical healthy eating plan. And here too, I'm going to try to be practical and realistic. So the first thing that you should see if you achieve a healthier metabolic balance using food and using all the other tools at our disposal is that you should see a smaller, more natural hunger level. And that means that being hungry makes sense to you and according to what your body's doing and that normal amounts of food should give you satisfaction that lasts for several hours between meals. Um, if you're having food that does not make sense or if you're having cravings almost immediately after you eat, then your metabolism is not in an appropriate balance at this point uh, and these principles are still a good idea but probably something else needs to be done. You can expect also that you'll have a better sense of well-being. Um, many people that have excess weight and have a metabolic imbalance, they have a body pain syndrome. Maybe it's focused in a certain joint, maybe it's in the back, maybe it's a total body pain, but as your body comes into a healthier balance, the pain should diminish. You should also see improved numbers in terms of health parameters, such as especially diabetes uh, and cholesterol and blood glucose variations. What about your weight? You may see your weight come down a bit, but you may not. And um, just the diet change and getting into a healthier balance is usually not something that results in 30, 40, 50 pounds of weight loss unless you take the extra step of reducing below a comfortable eating level. Um, and, and that has its place, but it's not really a sustainable part of the plan. And so to be honest, a healthy eating plan is good for weight stability and can be an important part of an overall major weight loss plan with some of the other tools that I've mentioned previously. If you're following a healthy eating plan after bariatric surgery, then of course there will be substantial weight loss and the healthy eating plan is part of helping your body maintain the improved healthy balance that you achieve through the bariatric operation. In presenting my guidelines here, I've intentionally tried to stay away from named diets. Um, the popular diets now are uh, ketogenic, um, Mediterranean, Whole30, and these do have some merit, each of them. Uh, but I don't think that any one of them fits with the population as a whole. Uh, I've also stayed away from um, philosophical lifestyle uh, eating uh, behaviors such as veganism and vegetarianism. Um, these certainly can fit with a healthy eating style, but uh, how that works goes beyond the scope of this video in terms of time. I want to cover a couple of semi-random topics that seem to fit into this healthy eating plan discussion. Um, first of all, if you've had bariatric surgery, it's really important that you take bariatric vitamins. Uh, your sleeve or your gastric bypass or your duodenal switch has created changes in the way you absorb vitamins, and so you need vitamins that are made to absorb with your surgical anatomy. Over-the-counter vitamins um, aren't necessarily going to keep that metabolism fully supplied with its necessary nutrients, and thus you will have a hard time maintaining a healthy balance in the absence of bariatric vitamins. There are at least three good brands of bariatric vitamins out there. Ask your surgeon or ask my team about that. Second important topic is alcohol. Alcohol definitely is a weight gain substance. And alcohol is not sugar, but it is very potent in terms of caloric load. And the thing about alcohol is that when you have a little bit of alcohol in your system, as you know, your decision making is a little bit more relaxed. And so you tend to be more open to social pressures and more open to impulses and more likely to eat junk. And so alcohol is kind of a double or a triple whammy uh, working against your weight control uh, in terms of its own calories and in terms of um, behavior outside of what you should choose for on the healthy eating plan. Coming down the home stretch in the video, I want to give you some caveats in hopes that the information here will be used correctly for everyone. First of all, this diet plan doesn't necessarily fit with duodenal switch patients because a duodenal switch does definitely reduce natural protein absorption and other nutrients, and so that requires a separate diet plan. This works very well for gastric bypass and sleeve, but not for every patient out there. Next, and as I always tell my patients, every surgical program has its own set of guidelines and they all fit together like pieces of a puzzle. So you can't necessarily pluck and choose different pieces of a puzzle and you can't pluck and choose a certain diet plan that may vary from the one that re was recommended by your home surgeon. So if you learn something in this video that you like, please do discuss this with your surgeon and your surgeon's team. Also in terms of cautionary notes, this video is supposed to outline a food plan that works in the long run uh, after a bariatric operation or someone who has not had bariatric surgery. Uh, it's not really intended for the first couple of months after surgery. Now I still have the opinion that the operation gives you a much smaller, healthy, corrected appetite, 
and I still don't believe that people need to push proteins, but that is subject to some discussion in our community, and that's definitely a place where you should talk to your physician um, if you like the ideas uh, proposed in this plan. Last of all, I'll just say it again that the science in this area is evolving briskly, so I may need to change this talk again in two or three years, and I hope that we do learn more along those lines. Now in final summary, the purpose of this eating plan is to try to help your body shift into a healthier metabolic balance. If you achieve that healthier balance, then you'll have a more natural, a more healthy hunger that you can trust to continue to sustain that natural healthy eating plan. The healthy eating plan is usually focused on natural proteins and green vegetables, and it does not include chemicals such as artificial sweeteners and preservatives. Enjoy.